Um, so we're just going to kind of talk through this and, and explain to you um, our response. And if there are questions, kind of bring them up as we go along. I think that will probably work out the best. So what I would like to do for you folks today is just kind of talk to you a little bit our response goals, what we plan to do. We do have a formal uh, state response plan um, that we use when we have some of these introductions. And then uh, Sean is going to walk through uh, the disease, uh, disease uh, scenario with you and, and try to explain moving forward how we can be best prepared. And a lot of things uh, I would have to say, and the reason for our talk, and the reason for uh, talking to you folks this morning is that we did have a H5 event in 2018 that kind of uh, drifted over into 2019 that we needed to respond to. And so some of the growers and some of the producers were concerned um, why things went the way they did. And so I really don't want to focus on the dirty laundry of the past. I want to go into the future and make sure that we can make things uh, better for all of us. So, I, I have to always start my talk with this slide. And, and part of the reason is, long before I got to the board, and long before NPIP became part of this whole avian influenza process, uh, Dr. Peter Poss and Dr. Dave Halverson uh, at the University of Minnesota put together an avian influenza cooperative control program. And, and really, I think when I look at it and I look at these four uh, bullets, I really don't think that things have changed a whole lot. You might change the terminology, you might change um, you know, uh, how you look at it, but really, um, as they were trying to respond with an industry-driven program, there was no government involved, there was no regulatory agencies involved. This was basically, you know what, we have this virus floating around and it's causing mortality, it's causing some disease issues, so what do we need to do as far as the industry and as far as the University of Minnesota? And I think one of the things that Steve Olson always talks about is the Board of Animal Health. How can those three kind of come together? And I think if you look at this, it's the whole educational component, uh, the University of Minnesota helping out with explaining influenza, how it moves around, uh, the disease it causes, how you do surveillance, all of that kind of the educational component. It talks about the industry reporting, and Sean is going to talk about how we've moved um, Unfortunately, I can still remember um, when we used the post office and mail. Remember? Anybody remember the mail? Before, that was before email, okay? So we send out disease alerts via mail. And so, yes, they did get there two and three and four <coughs> days late, but let, eventually they got there. Um, but it's that whole reporting and letting your neighbors know and letting the people who are impacted know about what's going on. Biosecurity, Abby just had a great talk about uh, the biosecurity principles with the NPIP and how that's kind of moving forward and how that impacts uh, how we uh, respond to disease. And then this responsible response that Dr. Poss coined. And um, again, this is not a 2015 response in every case. And so I think as we walk through the scenario and as we actually are looking at revising our plan, um, I think this is a great opportunity to, for you folks to, to uh, kind of see what's going on. I have to grab some water quickly <coughs> because this is a high pressure, pressure situation. <laughs> but I think that um, part of the reason that we um, we had some difficulties in 2018 are these three documents that you see up on the screen. So in 20, uh, 2004, 15 years ago, we put together a Minnesota plan. And it was called our State Response Plan. And that has gone through a number of revisions. And basically, for you folks, what you need to know is that uh, the board holds together university and industry people, and we put together a plan and put it on paper. Just like a biosecurity plan, Abby, you got to put it on paper so that everybody is on the same page with the response. 
If we do not have one put together and if we do not have one approved, the USDA will not provide any funding for any of our response. So in other words, the state has no coffers for indemnity, the state has no coffers for compensation. We rely on the federal government to help us with this response. And every state is in the same boat, okay? So we need to have a state response plan that's approved, that people buy into, that people will agree to. And we've revised this thing multiple times over the past 15 years. Um, it, but we have to follow in the middle, you will see uh, the NPIP, the National Poultry Improvement Plan, uh, July 19, 2018, is kind of lays out, here, here are the components that you have to have in your state response plan. Okay, that's good. <clears throat> but after 2015, USDA put on some additional stipulations. And so on the upper left, you'll see that Dr. Jack Shear who is the national uh, USDA veterinarian, put together a document last year in 2018 saying that, okay, NPIP is good, you got your state response plan, that's all good, but here are some additional guidance documents so that we get all of the states more kind of on the same page with their response plan. So, um, because we did have an event in 2018 and because we were a little behind in our review, vision of our state response plan, we were a little bit behind the eight ball with this. And we actually had a grace period last year where um, USDA said, you know what, we really don't want states revising their plans at all, just stop. Let's take a breather because if you remember, in addition to our 2015 event, there was a 2016 high path event in Indiana. We had some other events in Texas, Missouri, uh, in 2017, so USDA is saying, hold it, just stop. Let's get everybody to take a breath. We're going to start revising and we're going to start looking for state response plans in 2019. So that's what we're doing right now. Unfortunately, we got caught in between here with our 2018 event. But um, my goal, um, Dr. Voss, along with our Emergency Disease Management Committee and the industry, are working on trying to combine all three of these documents. Okay, so as a grower, what do you need to know? Um, you'll see this box up on the left, uh, up on the right of you, and you'll see that uh, there are different zones or different colored circles or areas, if you will. And so as part of our response, as part of what we do when we in, uh, have an introduction of influenza is we need to kind of follow our plan as I mentioned. And so this is our initial response. This is what the state along with the industry is going to be doing. Um, and we're going to do it right now. I mean this is like immediately we have to implement this and move very quickly. So the second bullet that you'll see up there is this EDMC Emergency Disease Management Committee. And this is a group of individuals, we actually have about 50 people on our committee. Um, uh, representatives from the industry, from the university, from, from the board, from other state agencies who come together and everybody kind of adds their own piece to the plan. Um, I want the growers in this room to realize that this plan has to work for broilers, for layer companies, for upland game bird producers, and actually if we have any type of influence in a poultry flock, we have to use this plan. And so we have to consider all of those different components when we put together a plan, and that's why we've got such a large committee um, to help us out with um, putting the plan together. When we have an introduction, we quarantine these suspect flocks. We immediately put together these different surveillance zones that we'll go to, into a little bit more detail. But I think in 2018 and as we move forward, we need to really carefully define the board's role, what we have to do, a USDA's role, as well as the industry role, because they might be all just a little bit different. But I think ultimately, we want to make sure that we get rid of influenza. Um, with our biosecurity, we, we contain it, and we have some other things that we'll talk about with biosecurity. But really, uh, and I get it, okay, I've been around long enough that I realize that if you don't have turkeys on your farm, you don't have birds on your farm, you're not making any money. So my ultimate goal 
with our plan is to make sure that the premises are managed properly and that we get uh, these places repopulated as quickly as possible. It's really, really important for us. All of you may or may not know, but uh, the reason you collect samples before all your flocks go um, for processing is because hatcheries and processing plants want to be part of the NPIP um, influenza programs for some of our for our breeder flocks and hatcheries because there are really kind of greater implications for that because we're looking at hatching eggs going to hatchery and then poults going out. Uh, we need to make sure that we've got probably a little higher standards for our influenza testing programs and so we have, as it's termed within the NPIP, clean programs where we don't find anything, we do not find any influenzas specifically for the H5 and H7 subtypes, realizing that for our breeder flocks in Minnesota as well as other states there's a lot of vaccination of breeder flocks for swine influenza which would be type H1 and H3. So those really do not fall under this program. Or we really concentrate on the five and sevens. So for our breeder flocks and hatcheries in Minnesota, we have plenty of them. We want to make sure that they're uh, involved here. But for, for most of the growers and the slaughter plants, we want to make sure that we have a monitored program because we do realize that uh, occasionally we will find some of these flocks and they are simply a monitor, which means they are being tested. And so, typically the blood samples that you folks collect, we will be testing for antibodies, and we have a couple of different tests, all of which um, happen at the MPTL in Wilmer. But we also um, are able to do all of the antigen or the PCR testing at our laboratory in Wilmer as well. So, all of this happens within our, um, within our Board of Animal Health programs. The testing is being done at the MPTL in Wilmer. Um, Dr. Voss and the, and the crew at, at the MPTL make sure that all of the, the testing is being conducted properly, on time, adequate samples, and all of this information is fed to the National Lab in Conyers, Georgia to make sure that um, if I've heard it once, I've heard it a number of times, it's all about trade, it's all about business, and that's why and that's why we're doing it, and of course, we have to make sure that, that, it's, that it's happening properly. And if you look on the bottom right, that is um, some of the samples that um, we set up. We probably set up about 50, 60,000 of these tests um, every year um, to do surveillance for avian influenza. And part of the reason that we have stuck with serology and this is with the support of the industry, is oftentimes with our low path influenza events, we do not see any clinical signs. And so uh, I probably should call growers more often and just say hello, as opposed to calling them up and saying you got positive test results. I mean, that probably would be a better thing. But because oftentimes when these samples or these positive results are received, um, we get reports of what's the best flock I ever had, or didn't notice anything, or something like that. It's got to be a lab mistake, you know, something like that. So, um, but, but it's important for you to know that we've really got a pretty high level of um, surveillance for influenza in Minnesota, and we really need to have that happen. Um, just, this is just kind of a testing schedule, just so that you folks all understand, so that all the growers know that um, for the plants here in Minnesota, as well as if you've got turkeys that are going out state, if they're going to South Dakota or Iowa, all of those plants are requiring basically the same type of testing program. Sample size might be a little bit different, but according to our what we have to live by, it's oftentimes within 21 days of move, but I know a lot of the processors are trying to skinny that down a little bit more and make sure that we get a lot closer to our processing dates. Um, we have programs, and you can see here, um, for, for layer chickens, for uh, upland game birds, so we've got different programs that happen for all the different commodities and so um, And so you should be aware of that, and that's really on the active, but we also have diagnostic or passive surveillance. For those of you who were uh, here yesterday, 
Dr. Saad talked about um, uh, the diagnostics that he's able to do at the MPTL and with our renovation in 2016, we have recruited in Minnesota an excellent um, diagnostician. Dr. Saad is great. And I will say that every time I'm going to get in front of a group, um, and I think that my colleague at the MPTL would agree that Saad is, has been a tremendous addition to the MPTL. And so that uh, when we do have some of these passive or sick bird calls, um, he steps right in and, and is able to communicate that to us as, as the board. And so that's, that's really been a big, big help for us. One of the things that I did want to bring up, and I know that there is some confusion out there with the growers um, that I would like to um, kind of clear up a little bit as best I can, is this whole uh, enhanced surveillance by the industry of this whole drinker biofilm sampling. And so I know a lot of you folks have been doing that, and a lot of growers have been doing that, uh, especially after 2015, and especially spring and fall when we anticipate that we might have some issues. Uh, this started out and continues as a research project at McRock with Dr. Car Carol Cardona and her crew and really has uh, been very helpful as far as giving a heads up to some of these influenza introductions. But it is really a research tool and it is really classified as an unofficial uh, testing program and so that um, we, and, and we do appreciate um, the sampling and the testing that's being conducted uh, using this approach. And we continue to work with Dr. Cardona's lab and the veterinarians to uh, collect additional samples after they get these positive test results. But for us to officially move as a response by the board or to request USDA funding, we really need to have either blood or trach swabs, and hopefully both, um, before we can move forward with the response. So, um, and I know that in some cases there's a combination of these testing and sample collection going on at the same time. But I just want folks to understand that this is not an official test for us as far as the Board of Animal Health. But um, I see that continuing as we move forward. Um, with our influenza in Minnesota. So are we good there? Okay. All right, I'm gonna hand it off to Shauna now and she's gonna kind of start to walk through a disease scenario for you, so. Okay. So like every good disease event, it's always a Friday afternoon, right, that we get notified. So here's our Friday afternoon scenario. Um, Couple other uh, options for how that information comes into us. We might have serology positive samples on the pre market samples. So the lab notifies us that we've got either AGID or an ELISA positive. Okay, that's one scenario. The other scenario is somebody submitted trach swabs. So as an example, our breeder flocks routinely use trachea swab samples, um, PCR samples, because they vaccinate for influenza. Okay, so that's their testing method. So we might have a trachea swab positive sample that gets reported to us. We might have clinical signs of the birds. So the producer calls us up and says, I have mortality. I've got, my birds are experiencing respiratory signs. Um, and that's usually when we direct them to, to collect some samples. As Dale mentioned with the, with the biofilm sampling, we might get a call from a company veterinarian saying we've got a hit on a water sample. Flock seems to be healthy. We'll direct them to get additional samples. So that's kind of how that information comes to us initially. Whenever we get any sort of positive test, any positive test for influenza at the MPTL or the BDL, those samples always have to go to the national laboratory. Okay, that is a requirement. And so that laboratory is in Ames, Iowa. So we're close enough that if we uh, are really suspicious that something's going down, we can get somebody to drive those samples down there to get samples um, there quicker and get, a, get some confirmatory testing. That confirmation is required before we start implementing our state response plan. That doesn't mean that we don't maybe get the ball rolling, okay? But we can't hit go until we get uh, confirmation from the National Laboratory, okay? They are also the ones who will confirm if we're dealing with a low path avian influenza or a high path, okay? 
Okay, we can't make that determination based off the samples we receive at the MBTL. Okay, we require the National Laboratory to do some additional testing for that. Okay? Once we get any sort of confirmation, so if I've got some positive test results at the MBTL, I will initiate uh, a disease alert. Have you guys seen these or are familiar with? Okay. I'm going to walk through what these look like. As Dale mentioned, he used to send them out by mail. I think they used to go out by fax sometimes. We've changed our format recently so that it's kind of more of a, um, this is a program called Gov Delivery that we use uh, to get some of this information out. What I do is I send it to our poultry veterinarians and I send it to the MTGA and I send it to our EDMC response. Okay, The MTGA then will forward it on to the producers. Okay, So what you get might look slightly different, but it's basically the same thing. We always get questions about the MAP code. What is the MAP code? So this is something that was put together by the turkey growers before my time, a couple of years ago. Um, and it stands for the Minnesota Area of Poultry Premises. So it's kind of a coding system to let people know roughly where those farms are located without giving a name or a GPS coordinates or a dot on a map, okay? Well, what it does, we've got 87 counties in Minnesota, okay? If you put them in alphabetical order and number them 1 through 87, that's what that first number is, okay? So this is the alert right here. We've got a 73 MELR 33B. 73 means Stearns County. I also tell you that it's Stearns County, okay? The second thing, the MELR, that is the township, okay? How I find the township, when I just need to look, I go to Wikipedia and I search Stearns County and at the very bottom you'll see a list of every township in there. You can usually figure out what that township is based off the abbreviation, okay? That's my quick and dirty way of doing it. Some people still probably use plat books. To look it up, you can find it that way too, okay? The next number is the section within that township, okay? And then that it's usually A through D could be potentially more, it's just the number of poultry premises that we've identified within that section. First one we label one, gets an A, okay? So this is 33B, so it's the second premise. So you can, if you understand how that code's put together, you can kind of figure out where it is in relation to your farm, okay? What we try to prevent is people who maybe shouldn't be having too much information from being able to find that dot on a map, okay? The other information within that poultry uh, disease alert that's in good information is what kind of flock is it? Are we dealing with a breeder flock that's older birds? Are we dealing with really young commercial birds, male, female? Um, if there's any clinical signs, that's always noted in there too. Okay, so that kind of gives you a little bit more information. And then the other really key piece here is the testing information. Okay, so we're going to tell you if it's a serology test. That tells you that it has antibodies. Do you think with a, here's a test for you guys. High path avian influenza, antibody positive? Will we ever see that? The answer is no, okay? With high path avian influenza, the birds die before they have a chance to develop antibodies. So if you see that we have serology positive, you can already say it's not high path, okay? It doesn't mean it's not serious and that we don't need to uh, pay attention. But that lets, also lets you know that you're a little bit further within that infection cycle Okay? You're not at the very beginning, you're probably closer to the end because the birds already developed antibodies. Okay? PCR positive results, that's going to let you know that there's still virus circulating. Okay? And I don't expect you to remember all of this now because it's all written down here on the bottom. Okay? So if you look down at the very bottom, this information does not ever change. There's testing information down here and it, and it explains to you what does a serology positive result mean. What does a PCR positive result mean? Okay. So reference that, and that will help you in interpret what that means as far as disease circulation in that flock. The other thing that is relatively new, probably within the last year or two that we've started doing, and that was at the request of the uh, Turkey Growers Board, was to put some sort of an alert level designation. So when you open that up, you'll see kind of a color-coded designation on there. Uh, to help say how serious is this, okay? The disease alert on the left is what we have used uh, and was using last fall, okay? A watch 
We try to do this like weather, okay? A watch is serology positive only. There's no clinical signs consistent with high path avian influenza. A warning, there's virus detected. That means we've got a PCR positive result. No clinical signs consistent of uh, high path. The critical, we have this as the virus is detected. We either have clinical signs consistent with high path or we have an H5 or an H7 um, test result. H5 or H7 means that we as the board have to do something. We have to initiate that initial state response plan. Okay? What this doesn't necessarily tell you, and this is what we experienced last fall, we had an H5 and we had no clinical signs at all. Right? I had producers tell me this was the best flock they ever had. And we had H5. And so we felt that maybe using that critical designation maybe was giving the wrong impression. And so this disease alert on the right, the only thing that's changed is I got rid of the H5. So if you see critical now in a disease alert, we either have test results or clinical signs consistent with high path. Okay? So we could have an H5, serology positive only, no PCR, it would get labeled as a watch. We could have an H5 PCR positive, it would get labeled as a warning. If we had an H5 that they designated as high path, it'd be critical. Does that kind of make sense with how we've got that laid out? It lets you know what the risk is of disease spreading off that farm. Okay, so that's a little bit of a change, but read those um, alert level designations when they come out to give you a little bit more information for what that means. Okay, questions on the disease alert right now? So that was a suspect, okay? At this point in time, we don't necessarily have um, test results from NBSL yet. I usually say in that suspect when I expect those, if it's one to two days, if it's five to seven days, depending on what type of test we're looking at. Once we get confirmation, I'll send a second disease alert out. The important thing to remember with this confirmation is anything right below this confidential here is exactly the same as the suspect. Okay, so you always have that suspect disease alert to reference back to. Nothing's changing in there. Well, what I am doing is I'm adding in bold up on top the test results from NBSL. Okay, so this says that NBSL is confirmed that H5, and that the board's going to be initiating their initial response and containment plan. Okay, questions on that at all? Okay, so once we've got a positive farm, we've got an affected premises. So that's either serology positive or PCR positive with an H5 or an H7. If you, this is you and you're the producer, what does that mean? Okay, the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to quarantine the, the, the premises, all the birds on the prem, so we expect that you're going to obey the conditions of the, of the quarantine. Okay. You will be assigned a case manager, so that's like that one person from the board or USDA, kind of your, our representative, who's going to be on the farm working with you to um, all the way through that process, so that that doesn't change. That was something we learned in High Path. Those case managers rotated out every three to four weeks, and it got really hard for the producers to maintain consistency. So now when we assign a case manager, they will stay with you through the end. What they're going to do is they're going to work with you to implement a containment level biosecurity plan. Okay, so this is above and beyond what you normally do day to day because you have virus on site and we want to keep it on site. Okay, we don't want to have it spread off site to another farm. We're going to uh, complete an epidemiological questionnaire to find out if you have any contacts with other people, either a neighbor, a shared farm worker, shared equipment. Um, servicemen that have come and gone from there to know if there's anybody else that's been at risk, okay, of getting it. And then one of the most important things is to complete a flock plan, okay. This is the, um, the management that's going to happen on that farm to kind of eradicate um, and eliminate the, the virus from the plant. So this will very specifically lay out the virus elimination activities, um, repop, restocking guidelines. Okay, so that flock plan gets signed by the state, it gets signed by USDA, it kind of lays out what's expected for um, clearing that virus off the farm. You'll likely be asked to conduct some additional testing, okay? If we have PCR positive only samples at this point, we've not done any serology testing, we'll probably ask for that. We want to know where you're at within that disease cycle, okay? 
okay? You'll probably have to monitor your flock weekly, okay? We want to know when that virus is gone. If at all possible, and everybody's on board with it, we'd like to try to control market these birds, okay? I don't think anybody wants to waste valuable protein and put birds in the ground if we don't have to. Um, and that's something that's not every state agrees with, but that's what we in Minnesota try to do if, if everyone is in agreement that that's the right approach. Okay? So we want to know where that, uh, when that virus is gone because then we can start making plans to move the flock to market. Okay? We work very closely with the Minnesota Department of Health because certain types of influenza have been known to go to people. So if we've got uh, farm workers and owners and people on the farm that have been in close contact with the birds, they want to reach out to you guys and make sure that everyone's okay and not showing signs of illness. So you'll probably be contacted by the Department of Health and figure out who all has been in contact with the birds. Um, effective parameter, and this is where we want to, certainly within that first 24, 72 hours, designate our uh, priority and our attention. Based on that epidemiologic questionnaire that we've done on the affected farms, we might identify that there's other premises that have birds or susceptible um, animals on it that may have been exposed directly or indirectly um, to animals, products, equipment from that affected farm. Okay, so we're going to want to do some follow-up testing. Those uh, epilent prems will be quarantined and uh, we'll ask them to do some elevated biosecurity as a precaution and we'll collect samples from them weekly for 21 days, just to make sure that there's no infection there. If we don't identify anything, that quarantine gets lifted, you're free to go. Okay? So that's an epilinked prem. One of the other things that we do whenever we get an infected prem is we like to draw circles around things, right? These are our surveillance zones to know who's close by that may have been exposed Okay, we use a 10 kilometer zone, so that's kind of a six mile uh, circle. That's this blue line right here. Okay, so this is from our event this fall. Okay, that red dot in the middle is the affected prem. All of the yellow dots are commercial turkey operations. Okay, we label backyard flocks, um, broilers, layers. We identify everybody that's in that area. Okay. There's a couple areas that we never really want avian influenza to get introduced. That's one of them, right? Look at all the yellow dots. Candyland County is another one, okay? Um, and that's where we had our two cases this year. Okay, so all of these prems within that 10 kilometer zone will be labeled as an at-risk premises, okay? They're within, you're close to an effective premises, so now we're gonna have some um, additional restrictions on you as well. Okay, so that's kind of where a lot of uh, these other growers get looped in. They're not, they're not infected, right, but now they're affected because somebody nearby has it. Okay, so these are birds with, uh, or premises that have susceptible poultry on them. At this time, none of them are showing signs of illness. None of them have shown any sign that they're infected based off laboratory testing. So one of the first things that we're going to do within that 72 hours is we'd like to get everybody within that zone tested to make sure they're, they're not infected. Okay. And we did identify some um, other affected prems based off that initial testing in 2018. Okay. Last fall, we did not quarantine these prems. What we're proposing at this point in time is that we do quarantine them, just so we've got some sort of a legal framework in order to request that testing and make sure that no, nothing gets moved off the farm without prior approval. Okay. It doesn't mean stuff can't move off the farm, we just need to make sure that we're all on the same page for how that happens. Okay? Usually here we're going to uh, require at least two tests conducted before any movement, and I think that's what we required last fall as well. That second test we wanted within 32 hours of movement. Okay? Last fall, a lot of these outbreaks happened right before Thanksgiving, right? We wanted to get some of these birds to market. We got those flocks tested. Two tests within 36 hours to move them. Okay. Sally? Do you want questions now? Or no. Okay. Um, so, going back to the epi premises, then, the epi lead premises, so I think you've got um, birds that are going to be going to market within that three week time frame. Um, so, would, so, other than the weekly testing, would there be any other requirements then? Dale, concur. 
correct me if I'm wrong on this, but my understanding is the same thing. We'd want at least two tests done, okay, with that last test within 36 hours. Is that and so, and I think part of the part of the confusion that we had uh, in 2018 was the number of samples. So typically, for our monitoring while birds are on the site, it's usually we want to make sure that every barn gets sampled, and we're pulling 10 samples out of each barn. But USDA is saying that you know what, before anything moves off the premises to the plant. We're going to be looking at a higher level of surveillance or size, and so that typically at that third, and so that's kind of what we went with that. So, um, but but certainly if there's um, situations where they got to move, and I think that's actually part of our control strategy to, uh, and I, that again would be another industry initiative is to depopulate some, selectively depopulate some of those areas. I mean, just getting turkeys if they're negative and they're close to processing schedule, it might not be perfect, but let's get them out of there before they become infected. So, Pete. Is that 30 samples per barn? Yes, you know. <laughs> yes, it is, Pete. The question is, is it 30 samples per barn? And you know, um, you know, uh, and I don't know if you're here early, but um, we have a lot of hoops to jump through. And so um, there's actually an additional document that I'm a regulator, but kind of don't like it sometimes because there are more regulations that keep coming down the pipe. But one of the new documents that they wanted to have put together before flocks were control marketed was this appendix. You don't have to know the name of it. But specifically on that, it said, yes, you will collect uh, 30 samples from each barn and that's the way it's going to be because they did some research at NDSL and the scientists there said that's the sample size we need so and they're paying and and actually when we talked about uh, the USDA coming on board to help us out with this in addition to the indemnity and the compensation they're paying for all of the testing so it's a matter of um, you know, can we get the producers to collect the samples? So, sorry. That that includes the labor to collect the samples. Then. Well, <laughs> I, know, I know, I know, I know, I know. But yeah, it, it, it's a, it, you know what? It's a, it's kind of a cost share kind of a deal. So, at least it's PCR samples and not blood samples. Does that make you feel better? Oh, much. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that. I think we we didn't do so well in 2018 that we're trying to do better is we're developing a, um, a handout to give to each one of these different types of premises that very specifically lays out what the expected testing is. Okay, so if you're in affected premises, you would get an affected premises um, worksheet essentially that lays out this is what testing is expected of you moving forward. Okay, this is your elevated biosecurity that we want you to implement. And that way, you know what's coming from us as the board versus if you've got a company initiative that maybe wants to collect some additional samples, which I think is great, but it's confusing, right? Because then you don't know where things are coming from and who's requiring you to do what. You'll at least know what we're expecting of you. All right, I was going to ask about that as to that was one of the biggest frustrations for us was the different had something and then we had other information come our way so this happened again are we going to all be on the same page is there going to be a little more uh, simple or is that it's still just going to kind of be company versus so so um one of the first slides was those three documents and putting them all together trying to get them in mesh and so as we were moving forward with our plan we said you know what i think that if we collect 10 samples per site, and I don't care if there are four barns, we'll call that good. Well, suddenly we get other information, and now we have to relay it from the East Coast to our Incident Command Center in, at the MPTL, and so, so everybody should probably know that as part of our uh, 
I would consider it streamlined process. Everything happens out of the MPTL. All of the testing, all of the supply, all that jazz. Everything comes. And so suddenly now we have to we have to change do it not necessarily in the about face, but you got to tweak it. So now we have to get it out to the case manager. The case manager has to get it to the producer. We have to make sure that the producer gets it to the person who's collecting the samples. And then we have to make sure we have enough supplies. Now we don't have enough supplies. Then it comes back. Then we have the wrong submission form. Then it goes back. Can you kind of see how this thing goes a little bit? So as Shauna said, we're going to have one sheet. If you're an epi, if you're a contact, if you shared uh, your skid loader to move some stuff three days ago, you're an EpiLink premise. And you know what? We've defined you as this. Here's your worksheet. This is what it's going to be. This is what you got to do. If you are a contact, or if you are an at risk, and you are three miles away, and we're not the only, I don't, we might go to church together, but we don't do anything else, um, I'm an at risk premise. Here's your worksheet. And we're still going to be working out, and we, and that's why, as part of our response plan, um, we need to drill down, okay, is it going to be 10 samples per box? I mean, those are some of the things. Here's the submission form you need to use. Here's where you have to deliver them. Is it within 72 hours? Is it weekly? You know, all of those specifics, so it's less confusing for you. And I think the other thing is that it's less confusing for the case manager, because then everybody's going to be on the same sheet. And that's what we, re and we're really, and um, I'll take full blame for all of the issues that we had because we were we were caught a little flat footed. Uh, what what uh, Dr. Boss, you probably want to explain how how this all started in 2018, but we were flat footed people wise when this whole event started as well. So um, you know there's always um, I was here, I had it covered. I don't know where anybody else was, but I was here. <laughs> you had it covered. I was in Kansas City at a national meeting getting ready for our national poultry meeting and um, I I'm on camera, I probably can't see this, so, uh, but I was prepared to do some other Friday night activities and suddenly I got a six o'clock call and that changed the next three months. So. Yeah, I mean, if I could just, um, you know, we could just have one person, you know, and not, you know, a company person and then, you know, a caseworker. It just would make things so much easier. I would say that was kind of a big complaint that we had. And, and the other yeah, thing? We just have one, one person, one sheet, one, and it's just everyone's all the same thing. Yeah. And, and, and I think for, for everybody in the yeah. audience, what you have to realize is that these case managers do not work with poultry all the time either. Right. So they are our district veterinarians. They might be our ag advisors. They're working on chronic wasting disease. They're working on rabies case and suddenly Dale calls him up and says you know what um, I need you to be a case manager and you need to go up to Melrose uh, this afternoon so get going and so I think uh, we need to so there are areas and we recognize that and 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 really uh, I want the industry to know that we are we've been working hard we've actually been working since January in this whole deal so so it, it's um, it's a little bit of a challenge yeah. Kim. Um, are we still going to have where we got the um, animal board, the health standard, and the processor can have a, a standard on what the on yeah. testing? Slide coming. Um, so the question is for. Um, so the So the question is regarding Board of Animal Health or the state plan versus the processor standards, if you will. Yes. Okay. And so um, that is entirely up to the processor and the, and the hatchery and, and other folks because this state plan, the state response plan that we've agreed upon, we got everybody on board with that, okay? And they've signed off on it and they said, you know what, this is what we can live with. And actually, um, Sean will be coming up to a slide where we talk about the whole virus elimination the additional testing that's required um, right here, and that was all in the flock plan. And that satisfies our um, requirement. Now, the processor, the industry, and I know there were some issues with that. That's, 
um, kind of above and beyond. <coughs> I, would, I, would, I would say it's the same as uh, the biofilm testing. I mean, those are some industry initiatives that are really not in our plan. Um, they could be, but it's probably not. So. And I don't know if that answers your question, but I don't know if that makes you happy. Yeah, I'm, I'm just telling you. It answers the question, but it doesn't make them happy. I understand. <laughs> I get that. I get that. I get that. So what we're also trying to do, um, you know, as you probably are all aware, Dale and I are working through our NPIP biosecurity audits. So we're expecting that everyone has their minimum biosecurity plan for everyday biosecurity in place. What we don't usually see within those plans is an elevated or that containment level biosecurity. So what are you going to do if somebody is, you know, three miles away from your infected farm or your farm that's infected? What additional biosecurity? do you want to implement? So what we've tried to do is create some guidelines. So if you're an at-risk prem and you're within that control zone, we're hoping that you'll implement some additional elevated biosecurity measures to try to make sure that you're protecting yourself. And so we're laying out some guidelines and we've worked with some of our industry partners um, to fine tune this as best as we can, but at least it gives you a starting point for what, okay, somebody's down the road that's infected, what do I need to do now to help make sure that I don't get infected? Okay, so we're laying out some of that. And then um, as far as uh, the effective premises, if we control market that flock, there's additional virus elimination activities that will, I mentioned it's described and laid out in your flock plan for what's expected of you. What we did in high path for virus elimination is what we're trying not to do with low path. Okay, that's above and beyond. It's a different virus. There's a lot more virus particles. It's a lot more dangerous disease foreign animal disease, okay? So what we've done this year for virus elimination, or 2018, is we, once the birds are moved out, you close up that barn, you heat it up, you leave that litter in place, you heat it up 90 degrees, if at all possible, for three days. It was challenging in the middle of the winter to do that, right? But that hopefully is enough heat and drying time, downtime, to kill off infected, infectious virus, okay? Once that's done, remove the litter, just do a dry clean. So we're not requiring that full wash down and full disinfection like we did in, in 2015 high path, okay? Once we get those barns cleaned out, your case manager will come in and take some environmental samples of the lab to prove to us, to you, to our trading partners that there's no more virus, okay? We're looking for evidence of live virus. We might pick up dead, broken down pieces of virus, but by the time we do all of that testing, we determined that it's not viable. We didn't find any live virus in 2018, or amount. Um, question on that environmental testing. I guess I didn't quite understand. It was a, there's like a setup period for it uh, that has to be done with some age or something before they can. So it seems like we had, a, it was tricky on making sure you timed it right to get the environmental samples. So, the, right, so what, what needs to happen with that environmental testing, we run it through a PCR test, so it's just like a trach swab, right? But if we get any positives on that, then it has to go into a live egg and we need to try to isolate the virus. We need to try to grow it, okay? That is challenging. The VDL does virus isolation and they do it not infrequently, but the amount of samples that we have, we would do 10, 10, 15, 10 samples per barn for the environmental samples. If you have four barns on site, that's 40 samples. Say 10, 15% of those had to go into eggs. Making sure that the VDL had eggs that were the right age, ready to go, was a, was a nightmare. Right? You guys probably all went through it. It was a nightmare to try to schedule it. We have scrapped that. All those samples will go to MBSL because they always, have the, they always have plenty of eggs available and can do it. So moving forward, we're not going to have that challenge. But it wasn't. It was a, it pushed things back much further than it should have. Jay, can we fix that? Yep, sounds like it. We, we, we fixed it. And that was a call, and that was a call with our USDA colleagues down there to say, you know what, this just ain't working. Our produce, this is not, this is not working. And so I think those are, um, those are relationships that you develop over time. And so that call saved you folks lots of time because now we can collect, it doesn't matter. And we get a PCR, they go down to NDSL, they can start them right away, it doesn't matter if it's Saturday, Sunday, holidays, they're moving on. So, 
And that's that something that they've pushed across the U.S. too. Right. So mm -hmm. if a California pockets that they're going so to ask to do the again same. Again, we get to be the leader in something <laughs> good. Okay. It's usually the second Boston trap that gets the cheese. <laughs> In our 2018 event, we also required a fallow period, which was just a two-week downtime. We're giving serious consideration to not requiring that if we can get USDA on board, but that's an unnecessary extra step, okay? So just note that it may be required, depending on the circumstances, depending on what happens with our response plan. Repopulation, so after we get those negative environmental samples and you're approved for repopulation, you can begin your barn setup. Okay, before any flocks arrive on site, all the provisions of the flock plan have to be met. Okay? Once those birds are on site, you'll, and they're at least four weeks of age, you'll be asked to test those birds weekly for 21 days, just to make sure that there's nothing live in there and that we're reinfecting new birds. Okay? You want to wrap things up there, Dan? So, um, so we're going to kind of wrap things up here. I think I'm going to get the hook from the people in the back, so we'll try to be compliant here. but. I, I would have to say that for, you, for the producers in the audience, as well as if you can extend the message, um, everybody on every farm should have enough BHI tubes, that's brain heart infusion tubes, they should have enough swabs and they should have enough forms. So that when you go home after the conference and it's Saturday morning, and for some reason you got a reason to collect, you've got the supplies, okay? Um, I'm really trying to encourage folks to make sure this whole biosecurity plan process is moving forward. We've got a September 2020 date um, that we have to be working against, and there's a person right at this table, Abby, who can really help out with folks um, uh, with this. Our authorized poultry testing agents, the people that are collecting the samples, um, make sure that they are up to date with their collection procedures and their authorizations. And finally, when samples come in, we have to make sure we get the right farm address, the farm name, contact information. I wanted to put in PIN. Shauna said they want to understand what a PIN is. I was going to say we need it for EMERS. She said they won't understand what EMERS is either. So you know what? Just have the farm name and the address correct and a phone number where you can get a hold of you and that would be very helpful because, you know what, every once in a while we do have a fall and we do have a spring when these types of animals show up. And so, um, you know, just be ready. So, um, Sean and I will be around um, for some additional questions unless we've got some here very quickly. Otherwise, I think there are other activities that need to happen. So, um, thank you for your attention and again, we'll be around. So.